In July of 2021, two employees of Milestone Materials arrived at a quarry in La Crosse, Wisconsin. As they drove up to the entrance, they came upon the bodies of three young men. They'd all been fatally shot execution style. According to historical archives of the local library, it was the first triple homicide in nearly 30 years. The news sparked a painful reminder of a decades-old case that ripped a family apart and then simply fizzled out. Hello, and thank you for listening. We did it, y'all. We finally made it to episode 100 and the year 2024. Happy New Year. My goal for 2024 is to get this plant looking how it was when I bought it before my cats started eating it. Anyways, unfortunately, this case is going to be a two-parter, so this is part one but I think it is definitely deserving of the extra time and attention to detail. So let's just get into it. When residents of the Brookview Mobile Home Park awoke on September 26, 1992, nothing could have prepared them for the news that was about to come. Off Highway 1461, east of La Crosse, no one in the community had seen or heard anything unusual. Unbeknownst to all of them, a tragedy was waiting to be discovered. 27-year-old Rocky Bork and his wife lived in the mobile home park and, for one reason or another, decided to walk across the street to his mother's home. He knocked, but no one answered. To his surprise, the door was unlocked, so he made his way in. The home was eerily silent and nothing was out of place until Ricky's eyes finally landed on the body of a woman in the living room. His older sister, 29-year-old Suzette Friedenland. Sue had been in town for less than 12 hours. The night prior, she'd made the drive from Minneapolis with her two young children. Her six-year-old daughter and two-year-old son were found wandering the home, confused and fortunately unharmed. When Ricky walked down the hall to his mother's bedroom, he found her and his stepfather in bed, deceased, still in their nightgowns. No signs of a struggle. Nothing was stolen, and nothing was left behind. And after brutally taking the lives of every adult in the home, the killer made sure to spare the lives of the children. Suzette May Bork was one of four children, born on October 29, 1962 in La Crosse, to Alvin and Celia May. After graduating from Logan High in the spring of 1981, she moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Alvin had moved after he split with Celia. Suzette briefly attended Bethel, a Christian college 15 minutes from the city. It was presumably in Minneapolis that Sue eventually met James Friedenland. They were married, and in 1986, Sue gave birth to their first child, a daughter, Jessica. Within a year, the couple had split, and Sue moved with her daughter back to La Crosse. James and Sue eventually reconciled, but then in 1989, while pregnant with their second child, Sue filed for divorce. She confided in a friend named Rebecca Brinkman that James had threatened to kill her if she didn't return to Minneapolis. While Sue lived in La Crosse for those few months, her mother, Cell, was happy. Cell never liked James and believed he was capable of violence. She didn't want her daughter getting back together with him. Cell complained to other relatives that James treated her and other members of their side of the family like dirt. When Cell bought clothing for her grandchildren, apparently James wouldn't let them keep it. According to Cell, he didn't think it was good enough. Sue eventually returned to Minneapolis and reconciled with James. They purchased a home in the northern part of Minneapolis, a three-bedroom, one-bath on North Logan Avenue, built in 1962. Sue gave birth the following year to a boy, Matthew, in 1990. With James working a blue-collar job, money might have been a little tight, and Sue didn't want to depend on James financially 100%. So, she started her own business, a daycare. Sue was now able to raise her children at home and get some money on the side while watching some local kids. A neighbor recalled watching her take care of the kids. 
quote, she'd wave at you when she'd take those little ones for walks. She was awful nice. In May of 1991, James Friedenland decided to take out a life insurance policy on Sue. He was the sole beneficiary and would receive $150,000 if Sue happened to die. Six months later in November, James took out a second life insurance policy on Sue for $50,000. Today, those policies would be equivalent to more than $450,000. News of the triple homicide made the front page the following day. The La Crosse Tribune titled their story, Three and Family Slain, printed on September 27th, 1992. Neighbors identified the deceased couple as Leroy and Sel Weibel, along with her adult daughter, Sue Friedenland. Sheriff Halverson told the press it appeared that the victims had been shot, but no gun was found in the trailer. Authorities believed at the time that the shooting was related to a domestic incident. Residents were shocked. They hadn't heard gunshots or any other signs of distress or violence. One resident stated that the Weibels were good neighbors. No one ever had any issues with them. She said, quote, They were the kind of people you would want to have in a trailer park. I just don't believe it. This is scary. This is a family-oriented trailer park. The sheriff declined to say if they had any suspects yet, but they did say they were on the lookout for one person they wanted to question. A 34-year-old man driving a silver Plymouth Champ with Minnesota license plates. That man would soon be identified as James Friedenland, the estranged husband of Sue. The La Crosse Tribune found that Sue had actually filed for divorce in May of 1989, three years ago, but the court filings had stopped there. The bodies of Sue, Leroy, and So were taken to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in Madison. There, Pathologist Robert W. Huntington III determined their cause of death. None of them had been shot. All three had suffered multiple blows to the head and upper body. The beating had been so severe that authorities on the scene assumed that the victims had been fatally shot. Investigators suspected that James Friedenland could have been responsible for the murders almost immediately. The day after the victims' bodies were discovered, Authorities made the 175-mile journey to Minneapolis. For four hours, they questioned James, trying to poke holes in his alibi. James said he hadn't left Minneapolis at all. On the night of September 25th, he apparently watched some videos and read a book. And by 8.10 a.m. the next morning, he was attending a group Bible study in Minneapolis. James gave verbal consent for officers to search his vehicle, which was immediately impounded and held until a search warrant was secured. Inside James's car, there was no evidence of blood, a weapon, or anything that traced back to the Weibel's mobile home. But authorities found one thing unusual, the mileage. James had gotten his vehicle serviced 10 days prior to the murders, and over that 10-day period, James drove a lot. He told authorities he'd only driven to work and for church-related activities, but there was 381 miles that James couldn't account for, that he couldn't explain. This stuck out like a sore thumb to investigators, who determined that a trip from his home to the Weibels was a maximum of 175 miles, or 350 miles down and back. However, even though James's alibi was incredibly weak, home alone on the night of the murders, and he couldn't account for those miles, authorities couldn't arrest him for that alone. They still didn't have physical evidence pointing to James. No fingerprints, no weapon, no tangible signs at all that James had been inside that mobile home. Only a strong possibility that he could have been. When Leroy, Sell, and Sue were buried in the cross on October 1st, James did not attend, but he did show up to court a week later, attempting to get custody of his children back. In the meantime, the children's custody was granted to Sue's sister, who lived nearby. At the hearing, a La Crosse County judge stated that James Friedenland was the prime suspect in a triple slaying. 
and refused to allow the children to return to him or have any contact with him while the investigation continued. James's lawyer fired back that there was no evidence linking his client to the slayings and no statements alleging he was a bad father. Counsel representing the county's human services department, which has a say in where the children go, stated that James continues to be a suspect, adding, There is some physical evidence that could link the father to the crime scene. If the defendant was present, it would indicate that he has neglected the children, at the very least. On another note, James hadn't contacted that human services department about the whereabouts of his children until days after the murders. At this hearing, the defense claimed that James had been in shock when police questioned him for hours, but that he, quote, adamantly denied being involved, and, quote, there is just no evidence that he was involved. James had fully cooperated with the investigation and was ready to give blood, saliva, and hair samples. At least that's what his attorney said. A three-day trial on placing the children was then set for November 4th, required by state law. District Attorney Scott Horn said he hoped the state crime lab would have evidence to report by then. The evidence he was referring to was obtained from the crime scene and James Friedenland's car. The custody battle wouldn't be hashed out until November 23rd. The judge approved a six-month order to prevent the children to live with their paternal grandmother in Minneapolis, James's mother just a mile down the road from where James now lived alone. A lawyer representing the children and the authorities agreed that it would be best to allow the children to live closer to home so that the daughter could at least go back to school. It was a win for James, who could now visit his children as long as his mother was present. What happened in the courthouse just before the hearing started unfortunately didn't make it to the judge. If it had, maybe James would not have been allowed to see his children at all. Or maybe it was something super minor, but this is all we know. A photographer for a local news channel was snapping photos of James walking through the lobby when James suddenly pushed him backwards. We don't know any details other than that because both men refused to talk to reporters about it but we did get the opinion of Sue's sister, who had custody of the children up until this point. She said she was disappointed by the agreement. She called her brother-in-law, James, a ticking time bomb and stated he shouldn't be allowed to see them at all. In the minds and hearts of Cell, Sue, and Leroy's families, they were all pretty certain that James could be responsible. But James wasn't officially identified as a prime suspect until eight months after the murders. In an affidavit filed in April of 1993, authorities laid out a number of accusations. These accusations didn't include criminal charges, but highlighted a large amount of circumstantial evidence about how and why James Friedenland would want to kill his wife. For the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Pat Doyle provides new details about the slayings and what investigators had so far. And this will be my source because unfortunately I don't have access to a 30-year-old affidavit that no longer exists. Printed on the 20th of May with the title, Police Say Lack of Clues is Best Clue in Triple Killing. Quote, For a place where three people were beaten to death, the home was remarkably lacking in physical clues that could help identify the killer, police say. The body of a Minneapolis woman, her bludgeoned head wrapped in a rug, was found in the living room near the door of a mobile home in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The bodies of her mother and her mother's husband were lying on a bed. A pillow covered the man's badly beaten head. Two young children of the Minneapolis woman were discovered unharmed in the home. Police interviewed the older child, a six-year-old girl, but declined to say what they learned. Nearly eight months after it occurred, the triple slaying remains unsolved. Now, authorities say the very lack of physical evidence, such as fibers or hairs inside the home, provides them with a clue. The killer may have relied on a knowledge of forensic science to cover his or her tracks. Pursuing that theory, police recently obtained a warrant to review transcripts of police science courses taken by James Friedenland. In an affidavit last month supporting the warrant, investigators for the first time publicly identified Friedenland as a likely perpetrator of the triple homicide. 
Friedenland declined to return phone calls this week. His attorney, Earl Gray, said Friedenland has denied involvement in the killings. Attorney Gray ridiculed the police theory, calling it the product of desperation, and stated, They don't find any evidence, and now they're saying he's such a smart person. Took these courses. That's the reason there isn't any evidence. Give me a break. Those are basic elementary courses. James Friedenland's father had worked as a Minneapolis police sergeant and was now retired. That might have sparked his interest in the criminal justice system. During the late 80s, James took police science courses at Hennepin County Community College, Prosecutors wanted to know exactly what courses James had taken and what was taught. They said those documents were needed to determine whether the coursework would afford James the necessary knowledge to commit such brutal murders without leaving much evidence. On top of that, the affidavit stated that the Weibels were security conscious. Outside, the couple had a motion sensor light and a peephole on the front door. Not only was the killer potentially let in, but they left behind hundreds of dollars found in Sell's purse and Leroy's wallet. But still, the killer took the time to wrap Sue's head in a carpet and cover Leroy's head with a pillow. Authorities believe this was an attempt to hide the worst injuries from the Friedenland children. The affidavit stated, The covering of Leroy Weibel's head and wrapping of Suzette Friedenland's head would suggest a sensitivity on the part of the perpetrator to trauma, which would be sustained by children observing the bloodied corpse of their grandparents and mother. Injuries so severe, police at first thought it was a shooting. Without any physical evidence, prosecutors are trying to compile all the circumstantial evidence they could including documents detailing the deterioration of the Friedenlands' marriage. According to the affidavit, James moved out of the family home in 1989. Sue then went to the court to demand child support. According to attorney Gray, the couple ended up moving back in together, which makes it seem like they were able to put their differences aside and get along, but a letter from Sue paints a completely different picture. The letter was mailed to Sue's friend, Heidi, on September 7th, 1992. This letter, in part, was published in the Lacrosse Tribune. Dear Heidi, And Jim is so abrasive, cynical, sarcastic, demeaning, and mocking towards me. In parentheses, he has always been like this. But he claims he loves me. And he has both feet in this marriage. But he is so mean. He mocks how I feel on the things I do and say. He's been bringing up my mom in every argument to say how I am exactly like her, quote, selfish, and how Jess is turning out exactly like me. He throws so many innuendos at me, but with him I can never defend myself because he has me as being the, quote, bad guy, the guilty one, the one who wants to bail out, just like her mother because she wasn't happy. But I'm so scared to get out. I lose my business, my, in parentheses, our, house, our van, one half, in parentheses, rather, less than, of the finances, and Jim would be a jerk. He would let me lose all of those things just to get back at me. The kids would lose their daddy and I couldn't afford a divorce, so Jim wouldn't be made to pay child support. Oh man, there is so much more going on than I could possibly write you. On the one-year anniversary of the triple homicide, the La Crosse Tribune spoke with authorities to get an update on the case. By this point, no charges had been filed. No one had been arrested. But investigators were confident the crime was solved. District Attorney Scott Horn told them, quote, The only way to describe it is it's a circumstantial case. There is no smoking gun. No eyewitnesses. No confession. The evidence has allowed us to eliminate certain people and certain types of people, end quote. The children of Leroy and Sel Weibel had been waiting patiently for justice. Leroy's oldest daughter, Terry, told the Tribune, quote, You'd like to see it put to rest. That's the thing. It's always going to be in your mind. We'd really like to see whoever did it caught. We feel that there's a good possibility that there will be an arrest soon. I guess we've just got to hope. Sel Weibel's sister published a letter in the Tribune at one point talking directly to the killer. Here is what she wrote. 
On September 26, 1992, Celia, Leroy, and Suzette lost their lives, and our family hasn't forgotten how they were brutally murdered. Three loving people. It hasn't gotten any easier to forget. Why did this happen to our family? That's the question we ask a million times a day for the past year. We still don't know who or why. There wasn't any reason why these three people should have died. No reason at all. There isn't a day that we don't think of Celia, Cell, Leroy, and of Suzette. And of Suzette's two small children, Jessica and Matthew. It's still very hard to believe that they are gone. We would never wish this kind of hurt on anybody. This is very hard to cope with and very hard to forget. Because of somebody, we lost a big part of our family. But our memories will never fade away, and that you can't take away from our family. God is taking care of Celia, Leroy, and Suzette. And at the end, God will get you. Thou shall not kill. On October 12th, James Friedenland left his job as a maintenance worker at McLean Midwest, an air conditioning systems company in Minneapolis. Local authorities were waiting for him, arrest warrant in hand. James was booked into the Hennepin County Jail and held without bond, charged with three counts of first-degree murder. At a press conference in La Crosse, Sheriff Halverson said there wasn't a dramatic uncovering of new evidence that led to James's arrest. The investigation had simply come to an end. Quote, The things that needed to be looked at to be sorted out basically have been done. Halverson stated that the nearly 13-month-long investigation involved as many as 100 people, including local police and FBI investigators. The criminal complaint against James was 23 pages long. A fellow church member and friend of the Friedenlands, Jane Patton, was actually visited by Sue before she left Minneapolis for the last time on September 25th, 1992. Quote, I gave her plants, hostas, to plant in her shade garden under her tree. She brought the kids from daycare and we had a real nice visit. Jane was completely unaware that Sue was about to travel to La Crosse, and she claimed that if Sue was upset and didn't plan on returning to Minneapolis, she probably would have mentioned it to her. However, it is possible that Sue knew that Jane would mention this to James. This neighbor and friend, Jane, was heavily involved in the church that the Friedenlands attended, but Sue was not as nearly active in the church as her husband, James. Jane also described James as caring, sincere, and sensitive. Jane obviously wasn't one of the people Sue felt comfortable confiding in about her marital issues. And there is plenty of evidence of Sue confiding to friends and relatives through letters and phone calls that James had threatened violence against Sue. Minneapolis residents that knew the Friedenlands were stunned and had a completely different perspective of James than relatives of Sue and La Crosse. The news of James's arrest for the murders completely shocked them. Annette Shannon lived next door to the Friedenlands. Her dining table was located under a window that faced the Friedenlands' kitchen windows. She stated, quote, I never heard an argument. You would be able to hear it, especially with the windows open. You can hear a door slam. But there was nothing. They probably heard more out of my house. It just blew me away. I started bawling. I just can't believe it. It's eerie. He's such a nice guy. The evening before the murders, when Sue and her children were 30 miles outside of Minneapolis on their way to La Crosse, Sue realized she'd forgotten her purse and driver's license at home. According to a friend, Sue told her that she couldn't go back home to get it because she didn't want to face Jim again. And I think this was the same friend that Sue ended up stopping at in North La Crosse before heading to her mother's. She apparently also told this friend, quote, I hate Jim, and Jim hates me. Sue also reportedly said that James was nuts, he was fanatically religious, that Sue wanted out of the marriage, and had no control over financial matters. Included in the affidavit against James Friedenlin was details of the autopsy report. It indicated that the victims were beaten to death by repeated blows to the head with a solid linear object, 
possibly with an edge. However, no weapon had been found. A coroner determined that the deaths probably occurred between 12.30 a.m. to 1 a.m. on September 26th. James told police he'd been in bed in Minneapolis by 9 p.m. that night and hadn't got up until 7.15 a.m. the 26th. A neighbor did report seeing James at the grocery store 45 minutes before he claimed he was asleep. When that neighbor returned, she said she took her dog out every 30 to 60 minutes between 8.30 p.m. and midnight, or possibly as late as 1 a.m. She said she didn't see any lights on in James Friedenland's home, as if he was sound asleep or wasn't home at all. When James was finally transferred to a La Crosse County jail in late November of 1993, his bond was set at $1 million cash. A trial was set for March of 1994. Up until then, the state and defense fought over what evidence could be submitted to a potential jury. In February, District Attorney Scott Horn filed a motion that referred to an incident in October of 1987. It stated that James Friedenland attempted to sexually assault a woman in Minneapolis, apparently climbing into her bed and touching her after drinking with the woman's husband. When Sue learned of this assault, she separated from James. She also reported it to the Western Wisconsin Legal Services and told her mother so. In addition to that incident, Prosecutors wanted a second incident involving James's violent nature admitted as well. At a camping trip in 1992, witnesses said that James grabbed a piece of firewood and used it to beat a baby raccoon until it was convulsing. Witnesses said James would have killed the raccoon if they hadn't intervened. On the defense's side, attorney Earl Gray was trying to tie the triple homicide to potentially a serial killer, to another unsolved murder in La Crosse, a murder most likely committed by an outsider to the community and remains unsolved to this day. 31-year-old Linda Wegner was a nurse aide at the Bethany St. Joseph Care Center, an elderly folks home. She worked there alongside Sue's mother, Sal Weibel. Linda was born and raised in Boston and had been previously married to a man in Massachusetts. In 1987, she and her second husband of three years, Glenn Wegner, purchased a plot of land. They planted 130 trees and hoped to build a new home there someday. In April of 1988, the couple moved to a secluded home on Zion Road in southeast La Crosse. Apparently, the only real action happening around the property was down the hill, where construction workers were building condominiums. On April 19th, Linda had the day off from work. As her one-year-old daughter slept in her crib that morning, Linda either heard or saw a man outside the home. Surveillance video captured a man driving an older model pickup truck near the Wagner's home, but authorities could never identify who this man was. At 10.30 a.m., Linda called the agent that had been renting the couple the home and asked if the agent had ordered driveway repair work. From that point on, we don't know exactly what happened, but Linda was presumed dead by noon because when her husband called, she failed to pick up. When Glenn returned home around 5.30 p.m., there were no signs of forced entry. He found Linda's body in the bathroom. Her throat had been slashed. Their one-year-old daughter was still in her crib, unharmed. Authorities said a small number of items were taken from the home a blue and white quilted bedspread, a pair of sheets and pillowcases, a black purse, and a woman's red robe. According to a lacrosse judge, the only similarities in these cases is the fact that both cases involve a female victim. But James Friedenland's defense team was trying to make it seem like the same people or person that killed Linda Wagner also killed three other people, Leroy, Sell, and Sue. And James Friedenland's defense tried to make this argument by saying that Sel Weiber was heavily affected by Linda's murder. Sel apparently expressed fears to several witnesses and, quote, lived in constant fear that she would be next. These fears that Sel expressed may have been exaggerated and dramatized by the defense team. But working with someone 
for at least a couple years, I believe they worked together, who is randomly and violently murdered out of nowhere would make anyone fear in fear of their life, especially if the county hadn't caught the killer. These fears that Cell expressed were perfectly rational, in my opinion. They had no idea who the killer could be, and she had every right to be concerned that a killer was on the loose. It wouldn't make much sense for the killer to then target Cell, her husband, and Sue. Whoever killed Linda Wegner knew that she was home alone in a secluded area with nothing nearby but some noisy construction. The killer had also made sure to steal Linda's purse, while hundreds of dollars was left behind at the Weibel's mobile home. On February 17, 1994, a La Crosse County judge ruled that the defense could not connect the unsolved murder of Linda Wegner to the triple homicide, stating that the cases are unrelated. This was a blow to the defense, but the judge also gave a blow to the prosecutors. He ruled that the prosecution could not bring in claims of James sexually assaulting a woman in 87 or the story about him nearly beating a baby raccoon to death in 92 because they were irrelevant to the murders. The defense had another trick up their sleeve, though, to push the blame away from James Friedenlin. In a motion filed a week later, they implicated Sue's brother, Rocky Bork, who discovered the bodies. The motion read, in part, quote, Rocky Bork was the perpetrator of the homicide in this case. Rocky had motive and opportunity to commit these murders. Certainly, he was in close proximity to the crimes when they were committed. The defense claimed that Rocky was in deep financial trouble with a, quote, $500 a month marijuana habit, that so, his mother, had refused to continue giving him money, and that Rocky didn't have an alibi. However, Rocky was eliminated as a suspect early on in the investigation. The defense was grasping at straws. The murder trial was expected to start on March 7, 1994, but a few days before, prosecutors received a critical new piece of evidence, hair samples, found in the Weibel's home, apparently tying James Friedenlin to the scene of the murders. The judge ruled that the evidence would be allowed at trial. The defense was furious and appealed the decision. Friedenlin's attorney stated, quote, There is no excuse for this untimely notice. Mr. Horn might say the state crime lab is busy and has no control over it. So what? The party to this case is the state of Wisconsin, and the state of Wisconsin has violated the discovery rules. Being too busy is not good cause. District Attorney Scott Horn said the delay was not intentional. 400 hairs were collected from the Weibel home. They were sent to the crime lab by mid-October of 1992. The last batch of hairs, about 70, were still being examined by February of 1994. In that batch, four of the hairs were found to be a match with James Friedenlin. Convicting someone based on hair samples alone rarely, if ever, works. However, this was the only physical evidence the state had, and advanced DNA testing wasn't available at the time, and even if they did have it at that time, if the hair didn't have a root, they wouldn't be able to get DNA from it. According to forensic experts, quote, hair comparisons are not a basis for absolute personal identification. It should be noted, however, that because it is unusual to find hairs from two different individuals that exhibit the same microscopic characteristics, a microscopic association, or match, is the basis for a strong association. So, either James Friedenlin's hair was carried to the crime scene by his children, or Sue, all the way from Minneapolis, or James had shed the hair at the scene during the murders. For a largely circumstantial case, this was a huge win for the prosecution. They told the Lacrosse Tribune, quote, In all honesty, this is the sort of evidence we were pushing for. The head of the crime lab defended his findings over the phone. He said many factors are used in comparing hairs under a microscope, including color, diameter, length, and inner shaft features. He stated, quote, we can't say that a hair came from an individual. We can say that it's consistent with their hair, and it has the same general pattern. Just like a lot of people have type A blood, a lot of people probably would have medium brown, medium length hair. The Wisconsin Court of Appeals decided not to hear the appeal made by Friedenland's defense, allowing the murder trial to go ahead after a slight delay. A judge scheduled jury selection for June 13th and expected the trial to last three weeks. 
On September 26, 1992, someone gained access to the mobile home of Leroy and Celia Weibel in La Crosse, Wisconsin. When Cell's daughter, Suzette Friedenlin, walked out into the living room, she didn't scream or fight back when someone savagely beat her to death with a blunt instrument. Her six-year-old daughter, just yards away in another room, heard a loud thump, and then silence. The killer then entered the Weibel's bedroom and did the same to them, fracturing their skulls. He took his time cleaning up in the bathroom, placed a pillow on Leroy's face, and wrapped carpet around Suzette's head. He didn't take the hundreds of dollars sitting in the Weibel's wallet and purse, nor hurt Suzette's young children. But he did leave them to wander the home for 12 hours, terrified and confused as to why their grandparents and mother were deceased and not responding. No forced entry, no fingerprints, no murder weapon. But authorities were sure the killer was Suzette's husband, who claimed he was asleep in Minneapolis at the time of the murders, hundreds of miles away. The murder trial of James Friedenlin was highly anticipated by the public, and it probably would have had national coverage by the media, but another incident stole the spotlight. One day before James went on trial, Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman were stabbed to death in Los Angeles. O.J. Simpson was charged with the murders a few days later. When he failed to turn himself in, authorities pursued his white Ford Bronco. TV stations stopped covering the NBA Finals and instead showed viewers the pursuit live to an estimated 95 million people. This police chase and O.J.'s arrest later that day was one of the most publicized events in U.S. history. With that hindsight, it's fair to say that most of America's eyes were on O.J. Simpson, not the murder trial of a random man in Wisconsin. Day one of James Friedenlin's murder trial began with jury selection on June 13th, 1994. James was seated at the defense table and appeared confident. He was apparently well-groomed, wearing a light gray suit and pastel shirt. Beside him was his defense attorney, Earl Gray, along with James's father, Gene Friedenland. Like I stated in last week's episode, Gene was a retired Minneapolis police officer, and now he's assisting the defense's investigation in any way he can to keep his son out of prison. District Attorney Scott Horn and the defense questioned 50 to 60 potential jurors out of the 134 that were called. They were quizzed about their personal lives, their relationship to any of the victims or witnesses, and their opinions on marriage and divorce. The state focused on jurors that had a positive attitude towards circumstantial evidence because that's what their entire case was built on. Meanwhile, the defense cautioned jurors that real trials are not like television shows and should not expect the defense to solve the crime. The defense also wanted to make sure potential jurors wouldn't find James guilty simply because it meant the case might go unsolved. After roughly five hours, ten women and four men were finally selected, including two alternates. Day two of the murder trial began with opening statements. Both the state and defense spent nearly two hours each on this. And because I don't have access to everything that was said, I'll be throwing in a few of the state and defense's quotes, as well as some commentary from legal experts about their opening statements. Let's start with the state. District Attorney Scott Horn said a mixture of fear, verbal, and psychological abuse, manipulation, and hatred produced a triple homicide in the dead of the night. Horn told the jury, quote, Three people are dead today that should be alive. When it came time for the defense, Attorney Gray painted his client as a religious, Bible-reading man who went into shock when informed of his wife's murder. He then pointed suspicion towards Sue's brother, Rocky Bork, 
and said his financial problems and marijuana usage was the motive. Gray told the jury, quote, I just want you to keep in mind the other side of the coin when you look at Mr. Friedenland. If you see a tear in his eye or a nervous smile, judge him on who he is, what he's gone through. And now let's get to what legal experts think about these opening statements at the time. They agreed that both sides were heavy on argument and light on evidence. Quote, I thought the district attorney made the most of all the evidence he had, and it was all very consistent. I think, though, that he probably wishes he had a little more of it than he does. And I think from Attorney Gray's perspective, he's trying to establish an alibi, and he wishes that he had a little better evidence with respect to his alibi than he does. The second legal expert pointed out that the incredibly long opening statements from both sides was necessary. Quote, The length of the argument is kind of a reflection of the circumstantial nature of the case. Obviously, if there was more direct evidence, you'd be focusing on that. And you can't hear. When you've got a trial that's going to be three weeks long, you need to explain everything. Experts also talked about the psychology of the jury, because they're average people, after all. Quote, I think people decide things emotionally first, and then they ratify their decisions intellectually. You do it, I do it, police officers do it, juries do it. You have to work to overcome it. What the jurors will be doing now is figuring out which lawyer fudged on them, and then they will decide which one they believe, and then they will start trusting that side more. So if either side was taking liberties with their representations on the evidence, they probably did so at their peril in a case like this. There obviously will be room for some difference in the interpretation of the evidence, but if they are outright just dead wrong on a specific fact, and it's a crucial fact, then they're in trouble. The jury paid close attention to both sides during opening arguments, and according to one expert, the defense's opening was effective. Quote, he was trying to show that this was a fellow that really was not the type of person that would commit these murders. Also during opening statements, the state played a recording of the 911 call reporting the murders on September 26th. 1992. And I want to use this opportunity to clear up a mistake that I made in the prior episode, part one. I got Suzette's brothers, Ricky and Rocky, mixed up. I'm sorry. Um, it was Ricky who discovered the bodies, but it's Rocky who the defense was arguing is the actual murderer. And going back to the 911 call, it was Ricky who placed that call, and while it was played in court, several relatives in the courtroom wept. This is how reporter Gaeta Holnagel described that moment in court. Quote, On tape, Ricky Bork describes finding his sister lying on the floor of the living room with a rug wrapped around her head. He also tells of seeing his mother and her husband in bed, quote, with pillows over their heads and stuff. I don't think nobody's breathing, ma'am, he said. In the background, Matthew Friedenland could be heard crying loudly and uncontrollably. Ricky made a second call to 911 after the first call was abruptly cut off. Asked by a second dispatcher what happened, he said, I don't know. I have no idea. I just got here. I haven't touched nothing. Rocky Bork arrived to the mobile home while Ricky was on the phone with 911. He was heard in the background stating, quote, I wish you'd get the blank here now. Because Rocky used an expletive, I have no idea what he actually said because the paper didn't print it. So, After opening statements concluded, the jury was bussed over to the crime scene to look for themselves. And while few pictures of the Weibel home exist, Gaeta Holnagel, a reporter for the La Crosse Tribune, was able to paint a very detailed pictures of what the jurors experienced. Quote, Time seems suspended in the mobile home of Leroy and Celia Weibel on Lot 20 in the Brookview Mobile Home Park on Highways 1461 in rural La Crosse. 
Washed dishes are stacked in the sink. An empty ice cube tray rests on the counter. And the Weibel's workrooms, hers for ceramics and his for model airplanes, are filled with projects in progress. Clothing hangs in the open closet in the Weibel's bedroom. And small model planes and decorative knickknacks rest undisturbed behind glass doors in the headboard of the bed. Except for a few tiny blood splatters on a white lampshade and on the wall next to Leroy's side of the bed, it almost looks as if the Weibels had rushed off to work in a hurry one morning and failed to return. But it's been nearly two years since the couple's bodies were found in the now-stripped bed after they were beaten to death as they slept. In the living room, a faded throw rug covers a rectangular hole cut out of the plum-colored carpet near the spot on the floor where the body of Celia Weibel's 29-year-old daughter, Suzette Friedenlin, was found the same day, with her head neatly wrapped in another throw rug. On the nearby recliner, blood, this time more than splatters, has dried into the dusty row's upholstery. The killer spent some time at the scene cleaning up, District Attorney Scott Horn told jurors in his opening remarks, and the lack of broken things indicates that the victims did not struggle with their assailant, he said. But the telltale black residue of fingerprint highlighting material that coats nearly every surface around the home, including the white front door, is a reminder that a tragedy happened there. And outside, until just before jurors arrived to survey the crime scene, artificial wreaths and floral displays hung from the deck and on a post in the carport as tributes to those who died inside. The state was really able to get into the swing of things on day three of the murder trial. The jury would have their sole attention until they rested their case, except, of course, when the defense cross-examined their witnesses. Even though the jury had visited the Weibel's mobile home the day prior, they hadn't seen what it looked like on the evening of the murders. The state had to get their gruesome point across, so they rolled in a TV and placed it in front of jurors. This is how Tribune reporter Bill White described the tape. The television set flickered on, and silence descended on the La Crosse County Circuit courtroom. Breathing became almost obtrusive, as videotaped images of a mobile home where three people were brutally murdered filled the screen. The scene shifted to the living room of the mobile home, and the camera focused on the legs of a person lying on the floor next to a recliner. Slowly, more of the prone body of Suzette Friedenland came into view. Her sister, Lynette Bork, sitting in the audience, bent toward the floor and sobbed quietly into her hands as the blood-soaked throw rug wrapped around Suzette's head could be seen. By the way, James Friedenlin apparently sat motionless at the defense table as this video played. He was actually unable to see the TV at all because of its position in the courtroom, and he also avoided eyes of the jurors who were watching. The camera panned to blood splatters on the walls, the disheveled sheet partially draped across the Weibel's bodies, the pillow covering Leroy's face, the back of Celia's fractured skull, the blood stains in the bathroom sink and the carpet, all in silence, without comment. No TV show. This was a real death. Twenty visual minutes of tragedy. Relatives who could see the screen, and some who couldn't, wept and held each other's hands. Michael Weisenberger, an investigator with the La Crosse County Sheriff's Department, said the videotape was edited only to remove sound. Later in the day, enlarged still photographs were shown to the jury. Friedenlin, who could have seen those pictures, bowed his head and seemed preoccupied with writing on a stenographer's pad. To refute the defense's claims that Rocky Bork had murdered his family, the state brought Ricky and his estranged wife, Crystal, to testify. They both told the jury that Celia Weibel had a good relationship with all her children, 
and often gave all of them financial help, not just Rocky. On the witness stand, Crystal said that Rocky and Celia talked a lot. They were open with each other about everything. Ricky and Crystal admitted that Celia objected to Rocky's marijuana use, but she never seemed angry about it, and never threatened to stop helping Rocky out financially if he didn't stop. Another highlight from Crystal's testimony was something that happened shortly after the children were removed from the home. Apparently, six-year-old Jessica Friedenlin grabbed Crystal by the shirt and told her, Aunt Crystal, I knew something like this was going to happen. So after the jury was dismissed for that day, the court had to settle something with the defense. In opening statements, attorney Gray had accused investigator John Schmidt of tampering with evidence. This was the officer that obtained hair samples from James Friedenlin and brought them to the state crime lab in a sealed envelope. The defense was arguing that Schmidt opened the envelope and planted some of Friedenland's hair at the crime scene. And this accusation didn't come out of nowhere, it was actually based on a prior case from 1987 involving Schmidt. Apparently, a man was charged for reckless use of a firearm, and his defense was that the gun was inoperable because of rust. The gun then sat in the sheriff department's evidence room until trial, and Officer Schmidt was in charge of overseeing that room. He admitted during a hearing that he had oiled the gun while it sat in evidence. Schmidt's oiling removed the rust and made the gun operable, which would have proved the state's argument for that case. Fortunately, Schmidt admitted to what he did, and the judge dismissed the case entirely against that man. And fortunately for the state, in the Friedenland case, the judge overseeing this case ruled that the defense could not bring up that mishandling of evidence from 1987. That would have been really devastating for the state, for sure. Nobody likes a shady cop. The following day, the state's case focused on the autopsies of Sue, Cell, and Leroy, as well as the suspected murder weapon. A chemist with the Wisconsin State Crime Lab testified on the stand and explained the process of luminal testing. Basically, investigators spray an area where they believe blood is or was, and the reaction causes the blood to illuminate, glow in the dark, under a specific lighting, not just glow in the dark. When they sprayed this chemical near the body of Suzette Friedenlin, it revealed a pattern an imprint of the supposed murder weapon. A 20-inch object, similar to a wrecking bar, tire iron, or nail puller, with a notched end. The chemist told the jury, quote, If that was the weapon, it could have been set down there while her head was wrapped, referring to Suzette. The weapon was consistent with the victim's injuries, according to testimony from the chief pathologist at the University of Madison Hospital. He told the jury, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be using a blunt instrument of some sort, particularly to fracture the back of skulls. He added that all of the victims had died from multiple blows to the head, and none of them had struggled with their attacker. On day five of Friedenland's murder trial, Suzette's father, Alvin Bork, took the stand. Alvin and Sel Weibel were married for 14 years and divorced since 1969. He was now living in Caledonia, Minnesota, but remained in close contact to all of his children. He described his relationship with Sel as that of good friends. On the evening before the murders, September 25, 1992, Alvin, His two sons, Ricky and Rocky Bork, along with Ricky's wife, went to dinner with the Weibels at the Ridgeview Inn. After the group finished their meal, the Bork sons went back to their homes at Brookview. Alvin went with the Weibels back to their home to wait for Sue and her two children. Alvin stated that Sue had left a message on Cell's answering machine, informing them she was coming to lacrosse and wanted to stay there. But before she arrived, Sue called her mother from a friend's house and said something about how she couldn't take it anymore. She had to get away. 
Sue arrived to the Weibels about 10.30 p.m. Alvin said that his daughter didn't seem upset and that the children were playing with the Weibels' dog. Alvin told the jury, quote, She appeared okay. She didn't confide in me. After about an hour, Alvin left. Before Alvin left the witness stand, though, the state asked about his son, Rocky's relationship with his mother, Cell. He said there was no hostility between the two, and, quote, They got along real good. They were always going fishing together. I never noticed anything wrong at all. Day six of the trial entirely focused on Rocky Bork, almost as if he was on trial for murder. But this was only because the state had to make sure the jury knew that Rocky was not the one who could have done this. In addition to Rocky, the jury also heard testimony from his sister Lynette, his aunt, his boss, and a coworker. All of them agreed that Rocky loved his mother. A coworker of seven years stated, In my opinion, they were not just mother and son, they were best friends. Rocky admitted on the stand that he had used marijuana in the past and was having financial issues at the time of the murder. He was also hazy about some details and contradicted some earlier statements to police, but when District Attorney Scott Horn asked if he killed his mother, Rocky was adamant in his response. No, I did not. A criminal defense lawyer who worked as a lacrosse district attorney in the 80s, Roger Legrand, watched day six of the trial. He told the lacrosse tribune that accusing Rocky Bork of the murders was a risky strategy that might have backfired on the defense. Quote, I don't think from the evidence that was presented today that anyone could see that Rocky would have anything to do with these murders. I thought that from the beginning it was a risky strategy for the defense to basically name Rocky Bork. Because if the district attorney puts on Rocky and presents evidence that shows that Rocky isn't involved, I think the defense tends to lose credibility. The defense is sort of throwing a lot of its eggs in a basket, and now that basket is gone. It seems like if you've used that strategy that Rocky Bork did it and basically it doesn't hold up, you've got a problem. I've always thought the other strategy of trying to get a good alibi and showing that the state did not have a strong case was a more compelling theory than pointing the finger at Ricky Bork. He seemed to have a good relationship with his mother. His mother bailed him out of a lot of financial problems that he had, and the family seems to have been a very close family. All along, what the state has tried to establish is that whoever did it had to be someone who was well-known to the people. It wasn't an isolated break-in. And then, eliminate all the possible people except James Friedenlin. I think, in some ways, if Scott Horn has eliminated Rocky Bork today, that really is helping his case, and is actually consistent with his whole theory. The final testimony heard on day six was from a neighbor, Nancy Zietz, who walked into the Weibel's home shortly after Ricky and Crystal Bork discovered Sue, Leroy, and Cell deceased. This is how Gaeta Holenager described her testimony and the reactions in court that day. Quote, When Nancy Zietz entered the mobile home of her neighbors, Celia and Leroy Weibel, September 26th, 1992, the first thing she saw was Celia's daughter lying motionless on the floor with her two-year-old son nearby. Quote, Matthew was standing there screaming, I want mommy, I want my mommy. Nancy held her forehead and sobbed as she recreated family members' horror and shock at finding the bodies of Friedenland's wife, Suzette, and the Weibels. By the time she finished her tearful 20-minute recitation, there was hardly a dry eye in the courtroom. Family members crammed together in three front rows either sobbed, wiped away tears, or stared down at the floor or their hands. Several jurors brushed away tears. So did some reporters. Called to the scene by the Weibel's daughter-in-law, Crystal Bork, Nancy said that after they entered the home, Crystal immediately attempted to get Matthew and his sister Jessica into another room. Ricky Bork was on the telephone talking to a 911 dispatcher. Quote, Ricky was on the phone saying, Talk to me, talk to me. We were looking for Matthew and Jessica's shoes. 
Ricky's brother, Rocky Bork, drove up a few minutes later. Nancy said she went out on the deck and tried to keep him from coming inside unprepared, but he swore at her and came on in. His reaction did not surprise her because, quote, I was blocking his entrance into his mother's house, and I was just a neighbor. Testimony on the following day, day seven, was pretty uneventful. A co-worker of James Friedenland testified about the Bible study he held on September 26, 1992. Suzette, Sell, and Leroy had been dead for hours by the time James arrived to his co-worker's home at about 8.10 a.m. However, their bodies had not been discovered yet. The co-worker said James appeared well-rested and refreshed with donuts for the group. When the group started discussing the Old Testament story, it caused James to become a little emotional and tear up a bit. The Bible study ended about 11 a.m. or noon, and James told police he immediately went home to take a four-hour nap. Friedenland's car mechanic also took the stand. Ten days prior to the murders, James had his car serviced and his miles were recorded. There were 381 miles that James could not account for during that period. Plenty of miles to drive to and from La Crosse. However, the defense accused the mechanic of getting it wrong, citing prior work orders where he'd made a mistake. The mechanic, though, was adamant he hadn't made a mistake. There was also testimony from the insurance providers about Friedenland's $200,000 life insurance policy on Suzette. It hadn't been paid out yet, of course, because James was on trial for her murder. Day 8 of the murder trial was filled with testimony from several witnesses, including one of James's co-workers, friends of Suzette, and a taped statement from one of the Friedenland's children. Robert Cretanen was a supervisor at McLean Midwest, an air conditioning systems company where James worked. Two days prior to the triple homicide, James and Robert were both in the restroom, having a conversation. Something that James said during that conversation would stick out to Robert after hearing about the murders. Robert asked James what his plans were for the weekend, and James responded, Sue's going to lacrosse. When asked if he was going along, James said, no, and quote, they hate me and I hate them. They're screwed up, brain dead, and my mother-in-law's a bitch. James also said that Sel Weibel was, quote, putting ideas into Sue's head. A woman whose child attended Suzette's daycare also took the stand. A couple of months after the murders, James stopped his car when he saw the woman in her yard. James told her, I feel like turning myself in so my kids can have a decent life. The witness didn't report this comment for several months because she, quote, didn't want to get involved. A marriage counselor told the jury that Sue had been unhappy in the marriage since at least March of 1992 confirming testimony from several of Sue's longtime friends and relatives. A couple weeks before the murders, Sue wrote a letter to her friend Kim, who had helped her move to La Crosse in 1987, after she and James split. The letter is dated September 4th, 1992. Sue wrote, I've never been so emotional. Jim says he's sick of the things I do, but he loves me. This thing has been hanging or sitting on the fence for too long. Three days later, Sue wrote her former college roommate about her unhappiness with James as well. I already read this letter in part one, so I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Sue wrote in part, And Jim is so abrasive, cynical, sarcastic, demeaning, and mocking towards me, but he claims he loves me. He mocks how I feel and the things I do and say. The kids would lose their daddy and I couldn't afford a divorce. So Jim wouldn't be made to pay child support. Oh man, there is so much more going on that I could possibly write you. Five days after this letter was sent, on the 12th, Sue wrote a letter to a cousin in La Crosse. Quote, I think the dude is addicted to religion, and I'm starting to feel like the worst sinner. I'm not sure Jim and I are going to make it. This goes way back to why I married him. 
This former college roommate received a second letter from Sue that she'd written on September 23rd, less than 50 hours before the murders. Sue wrote, quote, I'm willing to settle this civilly and with dignity, but Jim won't even discuss a divorce because it's not an option. The most intense part of this day's testimony, and possibly the entire trial, was the videotape of six-year-old Jessica Friedenlin. This is how Bill White described her testimony for the Lacrosse Tribune. Innocence in the remembrance of horror. The little girl's story about how she and her two-year-old brother spent more than 12 hours in a mobile home with the beaten bodies of their mother and grandparents left a crowded courtroom emotionally spent. Her sweet voice and matter-of-fact narrative brought tears and sometimes gasps of compassion. Quote, We found my mom laying on the floor with a, um, a rug on her head, you know. It was all full of blood. And I found grandma. She had a paper bag over her head, and it was all blood. And Papa had a blood bag. And I found blood on the floor. What do you think? The interviewer asked. I was scared, she responded. Jessica Friedenlin, then six, was talking with Mary Bill Skimper, a lacrosse human services social worker on September 27, 1992, the day after discovering the bodies of Sue, Sell, and Leroy. Jessica and Matthew awoke on September 26, 1992, to a scene of blood and mayhem. She was unable to be specific about times or intervals, but was consistent in her descriptions of other details during her interview with Bill Skimper and Ackerman. She said she did not see anyone or hear anything during the night, except a thump, sometime after her mother left the bedroom where they were sleeping, and went into the living room. It was kind of dark and kind of light, she said, when she went into the living room and found her mother's body, still clad in pajamas but cold, lying beside a chair. After knocking three times on her grandparents' bedroom door, she entered and found the Weibels on their bed. I tried talking to my mom and grandma, Jessica said. They wouldn't try to answer me. Jessica said she put a blanket from the couch over her mother. She said they spent most of the day napping or drawing pictures with crayons and pencils for their mother until their aunt and uncle, Crystal and Ricky Bork, came to the house in the late afternoon. Both Bill Skimper and Milwaukee child psychologist Mark Ackerman tried to find out the relationship between Suzette and James Friedenland. They sure fighted a lot, Jessica told Ackerman, recalling past incidents. They screamed through the whole entire house. My mama was going to come rub my back, and I plugged my ears because my mommy and daddy were fighting, and I came down with my brother and we said quiet, so we went back to bed shouting again, quiet. And then they settled down, and then mom came up, and then my dad had a steaming face on. He was so angry. Jessica said she never saw either of her parents hit the other or threaten anyone, but they sometimes spanked her. Ackerman asked, so who spanked you more, your mommy or your daddy? My dad spanks more, she said, because I have a list up in my mind, and my dad got some more exes, and my mom's got less, and she's got a row of smiley faces, and my dad's got a row of sad faces. Another excerpt from Jessica's testimony featured in this article is the child psychologist asking her what she would wish for if she had three wishes. And at this point, Jessica was living with an aunt and wasn't allowed to see her father. Jessica stated, quote, I could go home if I could see my mom and I would wish that my mom has never died. Later, Ackerman asked what Jessica liked best about her father. Quote, Um, he tucks me to bed. When asked what she doesn't like, Jessica responded, Um, that he always has to go to work. Day 9 of Friedenland's murder trial featured testimony from a half dozen experts and friends of the victims. One investigator detailed his interaction with James after informing him of the murders. Quote, he stared at me with a kind of stunned look, his mouth open. After the investigators said the children were with a relative in lacrosse, that's when James's eyes got a little misty. 
During the interview, James admitted he was having marital problems. The investigator said, quote, He had told her he was not going to help her or hinder her. He was not going to get an attorney. He was not moving out of the house. He was not giving up the kids. A neighbor in Minneapolis testified that she saw Frieden Lynn at the grocery store the night of the murders. James apparently bought a 16-ounce soft drink and a bag of snacks at 8 p.m. This conflicts with his statements to police about being home by 7.15 p.m. and never leaving the house. The witness also spoke about walking her dog every hour until 1 a.m. and said she never saw a light on at the Friedenland home. James had also told investigators at one point that he received two calls after 8 p.m. on the night of the murders. Apparently from a woman saying she was trying to reach the Humane Society about some stray cats. An employee from the shelter said they never received a call concerning stray cats that night. So either that woman never ended up finding the correct number, or James was trying and failing to strengthen his alibi. A couple from James's church also testified. After the murders and before James was arrested, the wife apologized to James in church for believing him to be guilty. Later in the parking lot, James sped towards her in his car as she was getting into her van. He stopped within three feet of her. On the witness stand, the wife stated, quote, I said, Jim Friedenlin, you scared me half to death. Why did you do that? James was laughing and told her, quote, that was the idea. The woman's husband witnessed this incident and took the stand as well. And he told the jury he was shaking afterward because he thought his wife was going to be run down. A longtime friend of James said he was playing basketball with him about three weeks after the murders. When James told him that investigators were checking his car mechanic, the friend said that investigators were probably looking at the mileage on his vehicle, which apparently noticeably shocked James. A family friend of the Weibels testified that she met Suzette Friedenlin in 1989, while she and James were separated. Sue told this friend that James was a controlling, manipulative person that could become very angry and explosive at times. The friend added, quote, She also mentioned that she was afraid of him and concerned that he would take her daughter away from her. He also said that if she would leave him, he would hurt her or anyone who tried to help her leave. The next person to testify for the state was a supervising agent at the FBI's National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime. The agent, who reviewed all the evidence and materials, said, quote, In my opinion, this is clearly a personal cause homicide. Because the killer hadn't forced his way into the home, there were no signs of sexual assault, nothing was taken from the home, and there was no indication the victims tried to fight off their attacker, the agent concluded that the killer had to be known to the victims. Also, the wounds focused primarily on the heads of the victims, which, according to the FBI agent, is, quote, strongly suggestive of a personal anger. The killer also wrapped Suzette's head, placed a pillow over Leroy's head, and, according to Jessica's testimony, a paper bag over Cell's head, suggesting a personal relationship to all three. In addition to that, the killer spent time cleaning up in the bathroom after the murders. A person unfamiliar with the scene likely would not have cleaned up, according to the agent. And by the end of this day, the state had rested their case. Day 10 was the beginning of the defense arguing their case. One woman who lived in a mobile home park across the creek from Brookview apparently arrived home around 1.30 a.m. the night of the murders. She said she saw a dark-colored blue or black passenger-sized car parked across the street from the Weibel home. She was questioned by police four separate times and even underwent hypnosis but she couldn't remember more details about the car and hadn't seen it since. 
James Friedenlin drove, at the time, by the way, a Silver Plymouth Champ. Testimony from Judy Wright, a psychotherapist and marriage and family counselor in Minneapolis, was the highlight of that day. Judy counseled Sue and James for about a month just before the murders. When asked by the defense if James was addicted to religion, Judy stated that James, quote, might be addicted to religion because he was chemically dependent in his youth. She was allowed to expand on this comment under cross-examination by the state, saying some people switch from one addiction to another. Quote, you can become addicted to religion in the sense that if you read the Bible, it tells you what to do. You can count on that. Judy also told the jury that it appeared that James Friedenlin controlled all the money, made most of the decisions, and routinely belittled Sue if she tried to assert herself. James would tell Sue, quote, that she wasn't smart, that she was too sensitive, that she was selfish, just like her mom, and that she didn't know God. Judy also said that Sue had, quote, some difficulty maintaining her personhood in the marriage and complained that James refused to explain their finances and frequently accused her of spending too much. Sue suffered from low self-esteem and felt that if she wanted anything for herself, she was being selfish. During the sessions, Judy said Sue seemed discouraged and depressed and even asked her to sign a suicide contract, agreeing not to kill herself. Also during a session, James admitted that he had tried to kill himself about eight years ago and had felt suicidal since. During the sessions, Judy described him as stoic and non-defensive, stating, Jim talked about doing anything to keep the family together. When James Friedenland took the witness stand on the 11th day of his murder trial, no one knew what to expect. Legal experts argued back and forth that it could drastically help or hinder his defense. Shortly after taking the stand, James read aloud two letters he'd received from Suzette while they were separated in 1987. These were drastically different from the letters Suzette sent in the weeks and months leading up to her murder. In part, Sue wrote, Dear Jim, it was more than wonderful to hear your voice. I want you, boy, more than life itself. I love you. I want you with me. Love, Sue. James's testimony lasted a total of three hours. At one point, while discussing his health problems, Attorney Gray urged James to lift up his shirt and show his scar. The scar was the result of a lung surgery performed in October 1992, a month after the murders. James apparently suffered from a chronic condition that caused him to spit out blood and make him short of breath, according to his defense. When it came to questions about his marriage, James admitted it was troubling at times. They'd been married since 1987, after their first child was born in 86. However, James claimed he thought their relationship was improving because of their marriage counseling in the weeks before the murder. James said, quote, I thought it was getting better. We were starting to talk. There wasn't that coldness in the house anymore. We were becoming friends. We would have arguments and I would say things that were inappropriate that I wouldn't say if we weren't arguing. Under cross-examination, James admitted he accused Sue of being selfish and like her mother, but that he didn't have any hostility towards Sel Weibel at the time of the murders. Quote, I felt that Suzette's mom was trying to get along with me. There were risks with James taking the stand in his own murder trial, but legal experts, in their opinion, said nothing new came from his testimony. Under cross-examination, he simply refuted any of the state's questions. All it did was humanize him, especially when James cried while reading Suzette's letters. The only glaring issue that appeared, possibly to the jury, was James's ignorant perspective on his own marriage. He claimed he thought things were getting better, but according to Sue's letters from 1992, they were going downhill and she had finally reached a breaking point. 
James Friedenland's testimony was the conclusion of the defense's case. Now it was time for the rebuttal witnesses to take the stand. The state called a counseling psychologist from the Family and Children's Center. This expert also taught at a nearby college on the topic of domestic violence. Prosecutors wanted to use this expert to paint a picture of James and Sue's situation and how abusive it may have been. However, this expert never counseled the Friedenlands, so it was left in the hands of the jury to determine if this applied to James and Sue. The expert explained that studies on abusive relationships show there is usually a pattern of verbal, emotional, or sexual abuse that occurs before physical violence. But even those who haven't had a violent past could react violently against their spouse. A feeling of abandonment physically or emotionally could trigger violence from a partner. The state wanted to remind the jury indirectly the fact that Suzette was wanting to end the marriage and left for lacrosse, which could have been the violent trigger for James Friedenlin, who said he would do anything to keep his family together, and specifically, keep custody of his children. The other rebuttal witness that really made an impact for the state was Anita Webb, a Minneapolis woman who met James at a rolling rink. She spent several outings with him and his children after the murders, between February and May of 1993. Her testimony showed that James Friedenlin could do a lot with a little sleep. Apparently, he called Anita between 1 and 5 a.m., and on several occasions, told her he had slept very little or not at all. Anita said the lack of sleep didn't seem to affect him at all. The friend that testified for the defense, claiming James appeared fresh and well-rested at Bible study hours after the murders, that guy's name was Jerry. And James brought Jerry up in a conversation with Anita. Apparently, in 1993, Anita expressed that she was surprised that James appeared so fresh after not sleeping at all. And that's when James told her, quote, Jerry knows what I look like when I'm up all night. The defense claimed that there was no possible way for James Friedenlin to conceal a 20-inch weapon while walking into the Weibel's home without alerting them or his wife. To disprove that theory, an agent with the Wisconsin Department of Justice carried a nail puller into the courtroom, hidden under her jacket, tucked into the waistband of her slacks. The agent then revealed the nail puller to jury members. District Attorney Scott Horn told the jury, the agent, quote, has been sitting there with a nail puller in her pants. Could she conceal it? You bet she could. Now I want to read some quotes from closing arguments, starting with Scott Horn for the state. This marriage was falling apart. There was emotional abuse, verbal abuse, financial abuse. James Friedenlin lost that power and control over Suzette, and he flipped. You should feel sorry for these children. These children are without their mother, but don't feel sorry for James Friedenlin. The evidence shows that he's a killer. None of us want to look another human being in the eye and say, I believe you're capable of committing this crime. It's comforting to look at a boogeyman burglar whom we don't have to look in the eye and say, that's the killer. But burglars don't spend time to wrap the head of a victim. Referring to the victim's injuries, he said, that screams rage, screams out anger, hostility towards these victims. Who had that conflict, that anger, ladies and gentlemen? It's only one person. He identified himself at the crime scene. The question is not the label that's attached to the evidence, but the quality of that evidence. What does it say? Did one of you see one little crocodile tear run down his cheek? Do not acquit James Friedenland because he reads the Bible. Religion can be a very powerful positive force in our lives, but it can be misused. Lead to death. Earl Grey gave closing arguments for the defense. Quote, 
Are you concerned about having an unsolved triple murder here on La Crosse? Of course you are. The most crucial evidence of innocence in this case is that little girl, Jessica. The eyewitness is Jessica, and she didn't see her father there. The direct evidence is James Friedenland testifying where he was at. The rest is circumstantial. If you pause or hesitate based on what you heard here, you have reasonable doubt. The chain of evidence is only as strong as its weakest link. All it is is a theory without any facts behind it. They have no evidence. The lack of evidence in this case is overwhelming. The circumstantial evidence and lack of evidence in this case cry out for a not guilty verdict. Let's give the benefit of the doubt as you are required to do. They have not proved their case. The man is not guilty. Every piece of evidence in this case you should approach with a so what attitude. They want a conviction here. They fought for it for a year and nine months. They've got to put the jacket on somebody. This is the state of Wisconsin against James Friedenland. It's an awesome power when the government points a finger at you. The defense also claimed this triple homicide was possibly the work of a maniac. Gray told the jury, quote, They don't kill every day. They don't kill every year. But when they kill, they overkill. They put pillows over people's heads. Make no doubt about it. This case is going to live with you and with the rest of us for the rest of our lives. The 12 member jury of three men and nine women began deliberations at 4.42 p.m. on June 29, 1994. They deliberated for four hours before quitting for the night. The next morning, the jury deliberated for another four hours before finally reaching a verdict. Not guilty. The atmosphere in the building was split. The Friedenland family celebrated and quickly left while relatives of the victims sank into their seats and wept, too stunned to leave the courtroom. After two and a half weeks of trial and eight months behind bars, James Friedenland was on his way back to Minneapolis to be with his children, now four and seven years old. Several jurors who asked to stay anonymous spoke with the La Crosse Tribune. Quote, It was the worst day of my life. Apparently, most jurors felt in their hearts that James Friedenland was guilty, but the evidence against him wasn't enough for a conviction. The jury went over their instructions seven times to determine what to do. Quote, All of us looked for loopholes, but there weren't any. I think 90% of the jury thinks he's guilty, but there just wasn't enough evidence. We thought Horn did a good job with what he had, but you have to be so sure. The jury made a decision to acquit James based on three major points, hair, mileage, and the wrapping of Suzette's head. They said four hairs found at the scene consistent with James's hair could have been carried there by his wife or children. The car mechanic had made prior mistakes on his work orders, meaning he could have made a mistake on the mileage reading of James's car. Basically, the 400 miles he couldn't account for could have been the fault of the mechanic. When prosecutors and experts said the wrapping of Suzette's head showed the killer had a close, personal relationship to the victims, the jury didn't buy it. Quote, We found that it might be probable, but it's not absolutely. And that's what we have to base our facts on. In the first poll jurors took after they sat down to deliberate, Three of the twelve voted for conviction, but in the end, obviously none of them did. Also, on another note, none of the jurors believed Rocky Bork committed the murders, and referring to why they made the decision that they did, a jury member said, quote, We just can't convict a man on mileage or hair that might have been secondary transfers and heads that were wrapped. Another juror stated, some of the jurors had a gut feeling that the defendant was guilty, but the evidence that the state provided was not enough to convict him of the crime. James's brother, Eric, briefly spoke with reporters as well. Quote, I don't know what to say. There was never any doubt. There never could have been any doubt. 
I think anger helped us get through this. Anger that we felt that they were concentrating only on James, and we couldn't understand that. They never led us to believe otherwise. They never did. A reporter asked Eric if he had ever questioned his brother James and outright asked him if he had committed the murders. Eric responded, There was no need to. As bizarre as the crime is, it is even more bizarre to think that he could have done it. I just hope to God that they find the right person. They have a lot of work ahead of them now. A relative of the Weibels told the press, quote, He did it. I have no doubts whatsoever. I haven't had. I hurt so bad for my family. I just feel sad for all of them. One of Sel's sisters added, quote, If he truly reads the Bible, he knows that he will, that justice will be done. Not today it didn't, but someday. James Friedenlin got into more legal trouble shortly after his acquittal. In May of 1996, James was visiting the Sunsplash Family Water Park in Fort Myers, Florida, when he got into an altercation with a child. Witnesses at the water park said he elbowed a seven-year-old boy, causing the boy to hit his face on a wall in the Lazy River, knocking out his two front teeth. Water park security held James until police could arrive. An arrest report from one officer noted, quote, I observed that the little boy was bleeding from the mouth and that his front teeth were broken at the gum line. The boy was hysterical and extremely frightened. The boy's 12-year-old sister told officers that James looked right at her little brother as he elbowed him into the wall. Investigators spoke with the children's mother, who said that, quote, due to Mr. Friedenland's obvious violent nature, she did not... She did not want to give her name or that of her daughter. She wanted to relay what had happened to them, but was not willing to give a statement for fear of retaliation. The woman told police her 12-year-old daughter had been swimming underwater in the Lazy River when she bumped into James. James reacted by kicking the girl in the crotch, splashing her, and violently shoving her away. One report said he shoved her underwater. The mother exchanged words with James after this, and this is probably when James said something that made her fear retaliation. When police arrived, James refused to cooperate or give any of his information, and authorities described him as, quote, very hostile. James, who is now 37 years old, was arrested and then released on a $15,000 cash bond. A newspaper in Florida reported that James had been working at the North Shore Child Care Center for about a year, and this was apparently tied to the North Shore Alliance Church. So this was a church-affiliated facility, and James was working with children, but also allegedly treating them like this. The statements from some witnesses wildly contradicted what James's sister, Lori, said she saw. She claimed that the seven-year-old boy was already bleeding from the mouth and that James lifted him out of the water to assist him. A charge of aggravated child abuse was reduced to third-degree aggravated battery by prosecutors in September of 1997. Just before a trial was set to begin in October, James agreed to a plea deal. The state dropped its felony charge and James pleaded no contest to the misdemeanor charge of culpable negligence. A judge placed him on unsupervised probation for a year and ordered him to pay $200 for the boy's medical expenses. The last time this case received any substantial media coverage was the 10-year anniversary, September 26, 2002. Reporters spoke with Suzette's cousin, Linda, and District Attorney Scott Horn. Linda stated, We want to know who did it and why they did it. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years. I wonder a lot what she would have been like now and what her kids have been going through without a mom. Maybe someone will come forth, saying they know some stuff. It makes our family happy that I don't let it alone. 
Linda nor any other members of her side of the family had spoken with James since he was acquitted. Scott Horn reflected on the not guilty verdict as well. Quote, It was the most devastating moment I've experienced in my 21 years in office. We felt the evidence would have supported the conviction. It was a circumstantial case. There was no question about that. But from our perspective, it was a case where the pieces fit. Horn said he had a, quote, nagging frustration, despair, that the person who committed this crime was not convicted and punished. It's a case I think about from time to time. It was a savage, brutal crime. James Friedenland can never be tried again for the murders of Suzette, Leroy, and Sel Weibel. However, if new information or evidence came to light, James could face charges relating to the crime. 